and welcome you to Advanced Databases. And what I'm going to do in the first part of this uh, two-hour session is give you a very brief introduction to some of the topics that are important in databases. So don't worry about taking notes and don't worry about understanding everything that you're listening to, but you should, as you hear these things, have a rough idea what I'm talking about because this course is advanced databases and it's assuming you've done a sort of introduction or preliminary database course at some point. And I'll mention as I go through this first hour some of the things I think you should already know about and if you don't know about lots of them and think you can't learn them quickly, you probably should not do this course. So I'm assuming at some point you've done an introductory database course. If you're on the computing program, hands up. Good, lots of you. That's the undergraduate computing program. You should have already done the first year database course. So I know you've done these things. If you're a JMC or EIE student, hands up. There are some of them, yeah. You might, in fact, if you're EIE, you have to do my database course, don't you? Haha, <laughs> bad luck. So you've already had one, but they've come back for an optional extra. Yeah? Yeah. And if you're JMC, I think it's optional, but you will have done the things I'm talking about, because I know, because I taught you. Yeah? And if you're an MSC student, you might come from anywhere. MSC students? Yeah. You might come from anywhere, so I've got no idea what you've done before but you should have done some sort of database course before and therefore know at least some of the things I'm talking about. Okay, so on to now a very brief introduction. And first of all, let's define what I mean by database or what people in general are talking about when they say the word database. In fact, it's a very broad term because the word database means any store of data. And in fact, people talk about databases even though they've got a filing cabinet with sheets of paper in. You know, that's their database that they've accumulated. So it might not even be on a computer. Yeah. But for the context of this course, I'm going to assume actually the data is on a database because, ha ha, you're on a computing degree program of some sort. And therefore, we assume that this information is not on paper. Yep. It's on the computer, but what structure does it have? And in fact, there are many different types of structure that you can associate with information when you put it on a computer. And that's generally called the data model, yeah? how I'm structuring the information. And at a quite a high level of abstraction, I can talk about there being unstructured data, meaning just information that's there in no real organized manner. So pretend... This is actually a sheet of paper that had been scanned in as a JPEG into a computer. That would be an example of unstructured information. Because though clearly it's actually information about some bank and the customers and the transactions they're having, because it's an image, you'd actually have to do some image processing to extract the actual information you want to get from it. And that's uh, an example of unstructured data. More usefully, in the context of processing on computers, you might have things as flat files. For example, a CSV file counts as a flat file. Why is it called a flat file? Well, in essence, because it hasn't actually got any real structuring to it, but it's got some convention applied, which if an application is obeying rules, will be kept to, and allows the information to be processed a little bit more easily than if it was unstructured data. So here's an example where I've taken the data that was on the previous slide and put it into a slightly more structured state. And since I'm going to be using this example throughout the course, I may as well actually explain it just a little bit so you get familiar with what I'm talking about. It's about a very small bank. In fact, it's so small that at the moment there's only six different accounts in operation. And if you flick through, you notice that these statements, which I've pretended I've scanned in and shown you have the details of which branch that an account belongs to. We've got a sort code which is associated with these branches, the name of the customer that owns that uh, account, and we've got a list of transactions that have occurred 
on that account during one particular month. And the transactions all have an ID, the amount, therefore, and the date at which that transaction occurred. And separately is held some information about deposit account rates. And in here, two accounts have been recorded as having a certain interest rate associated with them, number 101 and 119, which appear there and there. Okay, so enough about actually explaining what the example is about. Let's carry on now looking at how that information over there has been structured here. And typically, when you take some information and put it into a database, you do a little bit of, shall we say, reformatting of it. And also, you do things like abbreviate or miss off things. So here, I've got current deposit current to identify current accounts and deposit accounts. So rather than write the full text in here, I've just taken this sort of important piece of information because I've decided to put all the information about accounts into a single file called account, and I'm identifying the different types of accounts there. And because all the account numbers start off one million something, I'm ignoring the, I'm sorry, 10 million something, I'm ignoring the lead 10 million and just storing the, uh, the digits of the account number in that uh, um, range. And similarly, because this bank called Tiny Bank will have its, all its sorts codes starting 5566, because for British bank accounts, the lead digits of the sort code are identifying the organization and the uh, sort of subset of the banking system that this thing, thing supplies to. So when we recall the last two digits of, of the sort code. And what else have we got going on here? I've taken away all this information about branches, which is effectively repeated in different statements where Gouge Street appears once here, Wimbledon appears one, two, three times there, and Strand appears twice there, and put it in its own separate file with information about each branch recorded once. That's a process called normalization, in particular putting things into third normal form, which you should have heard about before and know how to do if required. And finally, I've separated out the transactions because you have several transactions uh, recorded for particular accounts, and therefore, because I only want to put information about each account once, but record many different entries for a particular account, you notice here there's three different rows which pertain to account 100, therefore, again, I've separated out the transactions away from the accounts and put them in a separate file, and again, that's part of the process of normalization. So that's a flat file, and going into slightly more structured, we might look at something called JSON. Everyone know what a JSON file is? JavaScript object, JavaScript object notation. Very popular for web applications. So if you want to get information out of the database and into a web application, quite often you want to extract it out in this uh, JSON format. And in some ways is a bit similar to a CSV file. I've basically got data items separated by columns, uh, by commas. But now I put them in square brackets, and in fact I can nest these structures if I want to, and I can also say some metadata about the thing. So where there's having data in my JSON file, I can also have some column information in my JSON file, which can state certain properties about these things, like the name, the title of the uh, column, and whether it's going to be left or right formatted when it's presented, and so on. So semi-structured data is things where there's a bit more information stuck into it, so it makes it a bit more easy for computers to process it, but typically are still textually based. So where I see 56 here, it really is the ASCII character for 5 followed by the ASCII character for 6. So you can criticize this as being rather inefficient because you're using multiple bytes to source something which clearly could have actually gone into one byte if I had encoded it as a normal number. And so, another example, sorry, of semi-structured is XML files, which you've probably looked at in some ways very similar to JSON in that there is some structuring of the information, but now it's just syntactically different. So I put in now that I've got names of elements and names of attributes, and again, put the data in text there. But in this course, what we're going to spend most of our time looking at is structured information. And in particular, 
we'll concentrate on the relational model and relational databases because that's the most popular, i.e. most common format used for storing uh, information. And in some ways, this doesn't look visually too different from what I presented when I showed you a CSV file, in that here I've got three different tables and over here I had three different files, but it's sort of very subtly but importantly different because when I create this thing, I'll give data types associated with the different columns and that will mean it's impossible for me to put in 10x6 in here because this is actually an integer data field. Whereas over here, I could easily corrupt the movement.csv file with some rogue application putting 10x6 here and suddenly I have something which isn't easily processable as a transaction ID and so on for the dates and the amounts. Yep. So I've got typing of information. I've also got constraints on the structure of the data. In particular, and very importantly, I can define things called keys and foreign keys. These are things you should already know about. But to remind you, a primary key or key is something which states that the attributes or columns stated in the key will be unique across the rows of, or tuples of the table. So here, the underlying up there is noting the fact that MID is a key of movement. In fact, it's the primary key. And all the MID numbers must be unique through the movement table. In your D, you see there's no duplicated values there. Furthermore, if someone came along and tried to insert another row for MID 109, say for account 120, the database would reject it, saying that you've got the duplicate key value in here. So you can't corrupt your data by mistake. Foreign keys are ways of ensuring that the different tables can reference each other in a consistent way. And to remind you, again, you should know what this foreign key is already, a statement like this says that the numbers appear in the movement table must also appear as numbers in the account table, which is quite a natural constraint. It's saying that if I record the details of a movement happening in the uh, bank on a particular account number, then that account number must appear as a proper record in the account table. And again, if you go down here, you'll notice that all the numbers which are appearing in the number column of movement appear in the number column of account, but not necessarily vice versa. In particular, number 125 there appears in the account table as a valid account, but not in movement. So this is one way checking that the values that appear here, which may be duplicated, appear here, not duplicated. It's a foreign key yeah, to a foreign table. And there's another foreign key example, analogously in terms of its semantics, stating that the sort code values here that appear in the account table, saying that an account belongs to a particular branch, must appear over here. And again, you notice that all the sort code values that are there do indeed appear at the top left. If you came along and decided that you, say, wanted to delete account 119 from account, the database, depending on how it's been configured, will do two things. It'll say, no, you can't, foreign key violation, because there are still records for account 119 inside the movement table. Or, if you set it up for cascading deletes, it would automatically remove the records for account 119 from movement. Either way, you wouldn't be left with an inconsistent database. You couldn't accidentally delete an account number and leave there being movement records for that account uh, in the database. Where, of course, in structured data sets like this, or in JSON files, or XML files, in general, you're quite free to delete bits of value from one place that may be referenced from another place and leave your data in an inconsistent state. So there's lots of things that relational databases do and other structured databases do that maintain the consistency of your data whereas <coughs> visually, when you look at it, it looks pretty much like it's still doing the same thing, i.e. holding tables of information. So, relational databases as a model is based on a sound mathematical theory which I'll be reminding you about next week. And the implementation of that mathematical theory in practice is invariably in a language called SQL, or some people call it SQL for completely 
archaic and obsolete reasons. So SQL is the name of the uh, language, stands for Structured uh, Query Language, and it's a practical implementation of the relational model. So again, this is something I'm expecting you've already done before and quite familiar with, so I'm not going to spend lots of time explaining this thing, but the basic intuition is you define in your data modeling language the tables that you want to create. And in particular, I've got three tables here, so I've got three create table definitions up here. And inside each create table, I name the columns or attributes of that table. I give the data type, and I state whether the thing must be not null or null. Not null means it's never possible to add a record into the movement table where I miss off the value of that column. And all the columns of the movement table are actually set to be not null. In fact, the only nullable column we've got in this particular example is the rate field in the account table up there. That's a nullable column. And that means it's possible, and indeed in this example here, uh, done, to miss values. In which case, depending on which database system you've got, it will visually, when you print out the values, either put a blank or put the word null. And in either case, what's going on under the hood is that that field is set to null, it's set to being empty. And we'll cover the subtleties of that later on in the course. In fact, some people would argue quite passionately you should never have nullable fields inside your uh, database. And you'll see why there's a possibility that argument makes sense as we go through things. And then the foreign keys and primary keys are defined quite intuitively. So for example, here, the fact that the movement table has a foreign key where the values of the number field in movement must appear in the account table is defined like this. And because it happens to be the case that the foreign key is also the primary key of the account table, I don't need to mention the columns here that are being referenced. So it says references account, and that means by default it's going to use the primary key of the account table. And if you look up there, the constraint about primary keys in the account table is just finding that the number column is the primary key of the account table, and hence I implement that statement uh, there. And the other foreign key is completely analogous. Interestingly, entertainingly, sort of by mistake, the people who were designing SQL sort of forgot the relational theory that you could have multiple keys per table. So the only way you can define two keys in the table is to make one of them the primary key, primary just meaning the main one, and having no other logical meaning at all, it just has an implementation difference we will, which we will cover later on in the course. And then all the other ones are implemented by creating unique indices. You know? So I can define a secondary key by saying create index, account type, index on account type, and that's because it's not set to be non-unique, it's a unique index, will ensure that I enforce that a second key constraint. So let's leave that slide up. I want to now move on and just mention a little bit of history of relational database products. And going back in time, the first database system launched was in fact by, data, uh, by IBM in the form of the DB2 product. And roughly around the same time, uh, a company whose name I've forgotten launched a product called uh, Oracle. And Oracle became so successful that they changed the name of that company to Oracle because it became uh, one of the best-selling uh, computing products of, of all time. So these two things actually date back to the 1970s. And one thing relational databases have, in essence, always been is not the fastest thing you can get to manage your data. One thing we're going to note as we go through these course, courses that relational databases do a lot for you, automate a lot of the controlling constraints and th doing things called transactions, which I'm going to remind you about in a second, and therefore cause things to go slowly compared to any old hack-up you might do in some other language. Yeah. DB2 and Oracle replaced various products which were available back in the 1970s, like hierarchical network databases, all of which have now fallen into disuse and been replaced by other sort of hack-up things, like various NoSQL products. 
which all, in essence, have the same property in that they sacrifice specific features of relational databases in order to make themselves go faster. And actually, it's quite an interesting trade-off that you have to judge when you're building a particular system or application about whether you require all the features of relational databases or whether you want to have something which is going to go faster but not provide you with all the capabilities you're going to see in relational databases. Later, because relational databases became popular, other people started producing copycat products. Sybase came along uh, later in a separate company, which more recently has been bought by SAP, the very large German uh, software house. And they introduced a variant of uh, SQL called Transact SQL, which had various new features at the time, including things called triggers. Anyone heard what trigger is? A few, not many. They're basically active rules that if you insert something in the database, automatically get set off to do some other uh, change to the database. And those proved very popular with various American investment houses and so made Sybase a very popular product uh, for some time. So much so that when Microsoft suddenly woke up and said, oh my God, there's all these people selling relational databases and we haven't got one, they went and brought the source code of Sybase and made it compile under Windows and launched it as their SQL Server product. And so that's why the language, the query language for SQL Server is called Transact SQL, just like Sybase's uh, SQL language is called Transact SQL. Microsoft have claimed that they've completely rewritten the source code uh, since there, and indeed the two products now diverge somewhat in what syntax they provide and what capabilities they provide in the SQL language, though to a large extent they are still the, uh, pretty much the same language. And then two notable open source products which you might well want to use for your own projects are Postgres SQL and MySQL. Postgres is the, shall we say, the cleanest uh, implementation of SQL provided in the open source community. It's the best adherer to the SQL standard. MySQL has always been the thing that you go for if you want the fastest thing you can get for uh, open source uh, relational databases. So much so that Oracle have sort of half tried to take over the source code and govern it and launched it as their own Oracle product, though it's still actually an open source product. And indeed, Facebook use it as their main method of storing information. So it's definitely something that can scale up to extremely large databases. All of these things implement ANSI SQL. ANSI stands for the American National Standards Institute. And periodically, various people in the industry get together and launch a new version of SQL, the ANSI SQL standard, which keeps up to date with the various things that different people propose in their SQL. So the standard SQL is basically created and evolves by different parts of this community suggesting changes that can happen to the SQL standard, they get merged in and moves the language forward. And we will be covering some of those developments, which I'm sure you haven't covered in previous courses uh, later on in this course. This machine's gone to sleep. So something which, about the period that Oracle and DB2 were first coming onto the market as relational database products and influencing in part what relational databases were, do, were doing is something called the ANSI Spark model, An ANSI being the American National Standards uh, Institute. And this very simple uh, model is also very important and powerful in terms of how you look at your data. You might agree with it or disagree with it, but the fundamental idea is it separates out how you look at the task of processing and modeling your information into three different layers. And try and separate out the functionality or sort of the operation of your database into those layers. And they're called the internal schema, the conceptual schema, and the external schema. Schema, by the way, is just the word that database people like to use when they talk about the structure of information. And you'll hear me constantly use that word repeatedly in the course. I talk about database schemas, and all I'm talking about is the structuring of the information. And what's important about this free level abstraction is it separates out implementation detail 
from a logical view of the data. And I'm going to be talking about both things in this course, because both things are important at different times. So in particular, if I look at the internal schema, I'm worried about how it actually operates in a physical way. So are there 2K, 4K, 16K page sizes? Is it using a B, B plus tree or some bitmap index? We'll be covering these things later on in the course. Do the strings end with characters zero, or is there some other method that's used to denote how long those strings are? So it's about how the database system actually operates. Most of the time, as a database professional, you don't worry too much about that. In fact, one of the concepts behind relational database products is that you shouldn't have to worry about these things most of the time. Most of the time, as a database professional, you operate at the conceptual schema level. And SQL as a language is designed for the database administrator to look after their database by writing SQL statements which control the structure of information in a logical sense and also write queries which can read the data or update the information. So here we've got a couple of examples of a data definition language statement in SQL, the top one, and a data manipulation language statement, the bottom one in SQL. The top one simply defines there is a table in this logical schema. So there's nothing about how it's going to be structured as page records or indexes or anything down there. And then the second thing queries that record. And again, says nothing about the order in which things should be processed. In particular, it doesn't worry about how multiple tables might be joined together as they're processed in queries. So in general, as a database administrator, you don't worry about what the database system is doing until it starts to go a bit slow. And then you suddenly think, oh my god, I do care about these things. And part of the reason why I teach you quite a lot in this course about how the internal system is working is so that you can go to a database product, look at something called a query plan, which describes how it's executing queries, and understand how it's operating so you can then tune those queries to make it operate more effectively. So most of the time, you're relying on the automation to take away that tedium for you, but some of the time, as a database user or database professional looking after a database, you have to actually understand these things and adapt how the database system is operating in order to make it go faster. And the final level of this ANSI Spark model is about the idea that you as a database administrator may then let other people, which might be other application programmers, have access to bits of your database which you call external schemas. So you have the idea you create views on part of your schema, which are then used for particular applications. But underneath, they're all actually accessing this conceptual schema, which you have overall uh, control of. Right, the last thing I want to remind you about as far as relational database, con or database concepts, which you should have done before, are things called transactions. And transactions are a very powerful concept in terms of allowing you to control a concurrent system in a very simple programming model where you can define by putting begin and commit around blocks of SQL things that happen atomically yeah? and obey what's generally called the acid properties, which doesn't mean they're taking something they shouldn't, but means they're executing atomicity, consistency, isolation, and durability. The atomicity means that if I've got a statement like this, say moving stuff from one account to another, so we've got two up, whoops, machine, we've got two update statements here. One of them is taking 10,000 pounds away from sort code 56 at the top, and the other one's adding it into sort code 34, the second row of that, so overall, the total amount of cash in the bank will remain unchanged. Simply one figure goes down by 10,000, the other figure is up by 10,000. And if it's atomic, it doesn't matter if the system crashes halfway through that, the database will be left with the same total amount of money. Consistency means that if all the primary keys, foreign keys, uh, type information, and anything else you might be able to define on your database was true before, it would be true 
uh, afterwards. Isolation means it's impossible for someone to come in and read the data halfway through your transaction processing. So in particular, if you've done the first step there, taken 10,000 pounds off sort code 56, and someone comes in and tries to add up all the cash figures in that table, they will not see that intermediate result. They'll either see what's called the before image or the after image, i.e. what was the state of the database before your transaction executed or what your database was after your transaction ex executed, not some halfway uh, house. And then lastly, you've got durability, which means once that commit statement is executed and you've had a response back from the database system saying, yes, it's committed, you know that even if there's a crash, of the computer running the database, enough information has been stored on, on stable storage such that it can recover the database and have your transactions still present there. Which again is a very powerful feature because it means you don't have to worry about flushing things out to disk all the time. The database system won't commit something. No, it does enough of the flushing that information can be restored to a consistent state uh, afterwards. To give you a hint about how these transactions uh, execute, and something, again, you should have seen before and have a rough idea uh, how it works, is that if you have a set of statements that looks like this, in fact, what it means is that a sequence of operations has to be executed on the database, and typically this is abstracted to be a sequence of read and write uh, operations, and this example here, which I'll go through in much more detail when I cover concurrency control, shows you the idea of reading and writing to branch code 56 as a primitive operation, firstly reading, then writing, and then reading and writing to branch 34, again as a primitive operation, reading and writing to that branch 34, and at each step here I've just annotated how the cash figures are changing due to the operation of that transaction. And then if, say, we had a second transaction that's similar, but just moving a different amount between a different pair of sort codes, it would generate a very similar pattern of reading and writing to particular rows in that table. And when I have a concurrent uh, execution, what occurs is that these things get interleaved together. And you should have the rough idea, and again I'm going to go into much more detail about this later on in the course, that some of these interleavings are possible and will maintain the ACID properties and others of these are not possible. So if you look at this uh, execution here, the top one is clearly going to maintain the ACID properties because what happens is one transaction executes all its steps and commits its result. And then the second transaction executes all its steps and commits its results. So it's clear it's going to execute in a serial order doing one thing at a time. But in any real quote-unquote system that's rather busy, it's not possible to, if you want the throughput, to allow transactions to be only executed strictly serially. And therefore, you need to allow them to operate concurrently to some extent. And it's possible that certain interleavings of operations will operate correctly. So if I look at this one here, this one is in fact okay because what happens is transaction two reads and writes to branch 34 first, and then transaction two does some updates including reading and writing to branch 34, and then transaction two goes back and reads and writes to 67. So what happens is in fact that transaction two executes first changing branch 34, and transaction two, uh, one executes second, changing branch 34 based on the result of transaction two, because that's an okay execution. I will be uh, reminding you how to justify that later on in the course, but plenty of other concurrent executions would not be good. For example, this one is bad because two transactions read the same value in branch 34, and then based on that same value, execute different updates. And you should know that that implies that here I've got a lost update occurring. Right? This operation on branch 34 has been lost because it's sandwiched between a read and a write from another transaction. And this one here is also wrong, more subtly, 
But what it's doing here is reading and writing to some object, and then another transaction is reading the value written by that other transaction, and then committing before the first transaction, transaction number two, has committed. And so what happens here is you commit your result to the database based on something which you do not know will be committed. And indeed, this transaction here could have crashed afterwards, and you result in a situation where you fail to maintain the isolation of transaction execution because you have the result of a transaction being committed based on something that, in effect, never uh, existed. In terms of how this all gets implemented, you have some view of the database where transactions written in your favorite language, such as SQL, goes into a transaction manager, gets broken up into a sequence of operations that actually need to be performed on the database, goes into a scheduler, which then decides how these things can be interleaved to maintain the ACID properties, and then gives it on to something called a data manager, which then executes that way in a me method that's efficient as far as cash, you know, caching information is concerned. I'm not going to have time to go through this again if you missed it ever in the history. You have to go back and look at the textbook if you're interested in how the data manager works. But I'm going into de uh, more detail uh, than I did in my previous database course if you did that, about how concurrency works at the uh, higher level. Sometimes you don't want all that. And quite recently, there's been a lot of talk about something called NoSQL. What NoSQL fundamentally does is something different from what classical relational database management systems do. So a NoSQL database has no standard associated with it. If you look at the different NoSQL databases that exist, they're all quite radically different in terms of what data modeling language they have, uh, what query language they have, and what properties they give you in terms of transaction execution, if there's any sort of transaction mechanism to, at all. But putting them together, the common theme here is you're dropping some feature or some features of the relational database uh, world. Either the ACID properties go, so in essence you don't have full transactions, or maybe you've got a quite different um, uh, data modeling language from the relational model being provided, or the query language is different. Uh, no SQL doesn't mean no SQL. Yeah. Quite a few no SQL databases use SQL as the query language, but they maybe don't have ACID properties yeah. and support scalability of data up to very large data sets. So then the term no SQL is pretty misleading. All it means is it's missing some of the features of classical relational databases such as Oracle or, or, or Postgres. In return for losing these things, the, the idea is you end up with something that can scale up to very, very large data sets, in particular be able to replicate and fragment data over a very large number of servers, and also possibly be able to adapt the schema at runtime, so you can have an application running with thousands of users uh, reading information, some writing to that information, and someone adding columns to the data as it goes on, and end up with something which can go underneath Facebook or Google or the likes of that as their main uh, data store. What, why do you actually need that? Why do you have to fundamentally break away from relational databases in order to get something that scales up? Well, the reason for that is the CAT theorem. And the CAT theorem is actually something that's been proposed about 10 years ago, but actually has been around in the distributed systems world under a different name for a long time. And what this recognizes is fundamentally that if you have a distributed system, i.e. something where you've got multiple computers talking to each other over some sort of network, it's impossible to maintain three properties simultaneously. Consistency, i.e. that all nodes in that distributed system are seeing the same data at each moment in time availability, that the system's always there available to use and doesn't have down periods where it says, sorry, it's system maintenance in progress, have to think. And partition tolerance, that if some part of the network fails and some nodes are unable to talk to other nodes, the system carries on running together. 
So CAP standing for those three things. You can have pairs of them, but you can't have all three. And the traditional relational database view of the world is, my, uh, is set in the premise that you're running on some centralized system. Yeah. Now, in a centralized system, you might have multiple CPUs, but it's pretty unusual for a computer to be able to have communication loss between the cores in a CPU. And if it does, it's probably going to crash anyway. So a centralized database doesn't have any partition tolerance because it thinks the different nodes are never going to be partitioned, but does give you consistency and availability. Whereas a distributed database, in terms of the classical relational databases decide, defined or developed to work in a distributed environment, have complex protocols associated with them for committing transactions where the different nodes agree that they're going to write certain data to disk and make it permanent. And those database systems uh, are, not, um, part, uh, are not always available. They're partition tolerant, but they're not available because when they commit the transaction, if there's a partition in the network, there's nothing they can do apart from wait. So if I'm on one node that's saying, right, it's time to commit this transaction, but another part of that transaction is on another node which is temporarily disconnected from me because of the network failure, there's no way I can commit that transaction or indeed abort it because the other node is in a similar state unable to commit to me, uh, talk to me and may have already committed its part of the transaction. So the only thing you can do if you're maintaining full ACID properties of a transaction when you've got partitions in the distributed system is wait until you've got reconnection between the nodes. Yeah. And hence you end up with something the CP, consistency and partition tolerance, but not availability because it has downtimes when the network is not available. And finally, the no SQL view of the world is that you give up the consistency, the ACID properties, and instead, say you're going to be available all the time, so you can always write and read data from your database. It's partition tolerant, it's going to carry on functioning when there are partitions in that, that network. But that does mean that if you are in Europe and you update some Google account and someone else in the US updates the same Google account and for some reason there's a bit of um, disruption to the transatlantic internet traffic, which does happen occasionally, the two things will go out of being consistent. Of course, that example shows you why you can tolerate it. If you're in that sort of application, it's quite unlikely that there is a valid update occurring to the same Google account on two continents simultaneously, because usually it's associated with one particular person that's physically traveling from one place to another. So the type of data you're handling these things allows the lack of consistency to be usually not too much of a problem. The first system that actually supported this type of AP model is DNS, the domain name system, which is a thing that you use when you type in a domain name such as www.doc.ic.ac.uk and get translated it into an IP address. And that's, in essence, a system that is a database because it has records of domain names and IP addresses, and it allows the concept that two primary nodes can be disconnected from each other and be updated simultaneously, and if afterwards they get reconnected, or, uh, they, they talk to each other and work out who's going to overwrite each other's copy of the master data, which happens occasionally, but not very often. Okay, enough information about uh, backgrounds to the course. Oh, I'll just mention one example of NoSQL. I'm going to mention more as I go through the course. That's Google uh, Table. It's an example where information is processed in a semi-relational uh, method in that there's one big table where you have lots of columns and many, many, many rows. And the typical examples given for this, because this is indeed how Google have used Google Big Table in practice, is as a way of holding information about URLs. And when they process information about URLs, they want to hold lots of different attributes at that, that URL and indeed be able to add more columns about those things without having to rebuild their search uh, engine. In particular, notice that one of the column families that are in here, 
is called the anchor tag. And it has the concept here of these uh, families where groups of columns are in a family which are going to be held together. And the anchor family is used to hold information about which sites reference a URL. And clearly, as you go crawling around the internet, from time to time you're going to find more sites referencing a particular URL. And you simply add on a new anchor column to that to have an information about one site referencing another site. So the top this column there says what does uk.ac.imperial reference, what does it point towards, and down here you get a list of all the sites that it will be referencing when there's an entry placed in there. I'm not going to go through more about that just now, but if you're interested in it, you can read up many papers uh, about uh, Google Big Data. So, on to now give you the course structure and then give you a, a break. The course is going to run roughly from week two to week eight and a bit. Last year, I agreed with the students that they preferred to have slightly more tutorials and slightly more information given to them and therefore it to run for 30 hours rather than the standard 28 hours. It doesn't mean you get more material, it simply gets, means you get more explanation. So my intention, plan, is to run it through to Monday of week nine. So this time in week nine will be the last lecture. You then have a revision period, and then in week ele uh, 11 you have a full two-hour paper as an exam. So it should all be clear to you in various pages and things you've looked at. This is the format of all the third level, three level, and four level courses in the department. So I'm talking to MSc students now and uh, EIE students. The format of the coursework is that I don't like you to overload you with coursework, and I like to spread it out. So what I can give you are four very short exercises, or quite short exercises. Most of them are quite a practical nature as well. The first one of which will be released at the end of this week. Mm. It is quite a straightforward one. Mm. So it means you can get your coursework out of the way and don't have it sort of in lumps as you go along. There's going to be some notes which I'll put on Kate uh, for this course, and there's also the slides. So I don't recommend that you rush off and buy a textbook unless you're extremely keen or already, already totally confused. But there are three books which I recommend as being useful uh, for this course. There's no book which really covers everything I'm going to do on the course, but there's, of course, there's books which cover uh, much of the material. The simplest one, in terms of explaining things in more depth and covering less material, is this Database Systems by Connolly and Begg. So if you are someone who is really struggling with you know, what is SQL, what's a foreign key, what's an index, this, this book will go through things in, in a lot of detail. A sort of intermediate level one is this Fundamentals of Database Systems by Amransri and Navati. So it's a very standard old textbook uh, that's been updated up to the sixth edition uh, last time I looked at it and is a good sort of uh, background material. Or, if you think you're going to spend the rest of your life looking at databases and doing database research, and this is really what you uh, want to do, you can look at Database Systems, the complete book, which is sort of that thick and covers lots and lots and lots of things I'm not going to do on this course, plus some of the things I'm going to cover on this course. It, it, it does aim to be very comprehensive in what it covers, and for that reason, it actually goes through things very briefly. So it's if you're uh, enjoying the course, finding it very interesting, want to read up more, then that's a good book. But if you are struggling with what you're doing on the course, it's not a good book because it doesn't give you any more explanation than what I give you. In fact, it probably gives you less information than what I give you uh, in the lectures. And there's going to be extra bits of information at this URL, which is off my homepage. And if you go to Kate, you'll find the only notes you see for the course is actually a reference to that URL. And at that URL, you can go to pick up the different slides. Okay. And if there are no questions about the format of the course or such like, I'm going to give you a 10 minute break and actually start doing the course. No? Okay. See you in 10 minutes. <laughs>